the um, most intimate relationship you will have is with food. You put it inside your body every day and it literally turns into you. And that relationship is also deeply and madly emotional. We celebrate by sharing food and when we're sad, we eat. So um, many of our strongest memories are also coupled to food and flavors. But we also define who we are through food. So you might remember those little books that we had when we were kids. You know, everybody filling in one page, putting your name, your favorite color, your hobbies, and your favorite food. Now we take pictures of what we eat, post it on Instagram, telling this is what I eat, this is how I want you to see me. Even on Tinder, people have like very limited space to give the first impression, and they want to tell that they are vegans or vegetarians or meat lovers. So food is a very powerful way to express our values and our social status, to tell who we are as individuals. But it goes way beyond that. We, as a group, as a nation, as a culture, define ourselves through food. Some people eat meat, some eat pork, some eat beef, some eat chicken hearts, some eat bread made of rye. It tells us who we are and it gives us a tool to separate the enemies from friends. If you eat food that looks familiar to me, you're probably one of the good guys. But it goes even further than that. We define ourselves as species through what we eat. Now, if you would have access to alien Wikipedia and check human, it would probably say that human is a primate that uses, controls other animals and plants to produce their food. And if you take a look on Earth from far enough, that's quite obvious. We, as species, are farmers. But it wasn't like that always. If we go back, 200,000 years, the anatomically modern human being was already there. We were collecting our food from the environment, nuts, fruits, leaves, occasional animal if we caught one. Um, so in many ways we were just another primate, just another ape, and harmless, insignificant species on the planet. And we lived like that for most of our history. It was only some 10,000 years ago, that some things started to change. We started to farm. And this was a major transition in how we fed ourselves. Agricultural revolution did not happen overnight, but it did change everything. We started to domesticate plants and animals to make them easier to control so that we could settle down and produce more food than we needed for our family so that we could support some others as well who could focus on other kinds of tasks, administration, trade, that sort of things. So those small communities, they built into villages, villages became towns, towns became cities, cities became connected by trade, we built civilizations, civilizations built technology and science and TED Talks, all the good stuff. But all this, accelerated in the past 100 years. It has been breathtaking. Tractors, industrial fertilizers, plant breeding have enabled us to produce more food than ever before and to support larger population than ever before. Actually, right now, we are more than 1,000 times more than we were in the beginning of agricultural revolution. And that did not come without some trouble. The way we produce food nowadays is the largest environmental disaster that we have caused. The nutrients we put on the fields, they leak into the water systems. Agriculture produces more greenhouse emissions than all traffic combined. And it uses about 40% of the fertile surface of Earth, the size of South America. And all that space is away from biodiversity. That has caused 
major extinctions. So we are quite literally consuming our planet. And that's not going to get any easier, because by 2050, we need to produce up to 70% more food without increasing the field service area. And the climate is finding, fighting back. Changing climate, extreme weather conditions, floods, drought, the hitting hardest our food production. So we are in this vicious circle. The way we produce our food harms the environment, and the environment punches back, making agriculture really hard. Obviously, there's a lot of things that we could do right now, easy things, stop wasting food, reduce the amount of meat we consume, come up with more resource-efficient farming systems. Yes, we should do all of those things, but they are just incremental improvements into existing system. We need something new, something else. A greenhouse is a structure that protects the crops from the weather. And this is the reason we can produce fresh vegetables in Finland through the whole year. We are the northernmost country on the planet that does that. Greenhouses allow control to the environment that the crops see, and that allows more efficient use of nutrients and water. And this technology is developing really fast. In the modern greenhouse, the plants are growing under LED lights, stacked vertically on several layers, in close to completely contained system, where you use water and nutrients extremely efficiently. And these can be placed anywhere. Antarctica, Sahara, Finland, underground, this is a step forward, and definitely part of the solution, but this is not enough. I think we can do much better. And this is me, with my parents. Some years ago, we had this old greenhouse in our backyard, and we're growing all kinds of plants there. That was my playing ground. I went there the whole summer and eating things that I was not supposed to eat, like probably right there right at that moment. That's going into my mouth. I don't know if it's supposed to go there. Um, I was fascinated about the flavors and tastes of plants and why they were so different. Why is mint different from strawberry and different from sage? And my mom was a chemistry teacher, so she could provide a lot of answers. But you know, you grow up and at some moment your mom's advice is just not good enough anymore. So I read a book. It was called The Medical Plants in Finland. I was seven. It was the first book I ever read which is a bit weird, <laughs> but it took me to study molecular biology and cellular biology because I really wanted to really go on the bottom of it. What goes on there in the smallest units of life in the cells? Actually, to figure out how life itself works. So plant cells, they can be taken out of the plant and they can be grown in laboratory in completely artificial environment. And they can do pretty much the same things as plants can do. They can take very simple nutrients and turn them into very, very complex biomolecules that we need as food or as medicine, right? So here's Arctic bramble. It produces a lot of very interesting biomolecules. The problem is it's almost impossible to cultivate. And it's getting really rare in Finnish nature. So, the lab where I work, they hacked it. They took some cells and grew it in the lab as a cell culture. And they did the same for many plant species. So I got into that lab. <laughs> you can probably figure out what happened. <laughs> so uh, they told me that you're not supposed to eat that stuff. We are in the lab. <laughs> you don't eat things in the lab. Now, I convinced them that we can do it. And it wasn't that crazy after all. So what if we could grow plants in the lab and grow only the best bits of it? And we could tell the cells what to do. So we can actually grow that berry in the lab. Berry, 2.0, completely contained environment. But we wanted to take this a bit further. We took that, all that complex laboratory equipment, simplified it, redesigned it, and made a device that you could have in your kitchen, in your kitchen counter, 
growing fresh food out of plant cells, out of any plant cells in anywhere on the planet. That's Arctic Bramble there, a cell culture. Yummy with yogurt. If we can do that with plants, could we do that with animals? Sure, let's take a stem cell out of a cow, produce muscle tissue in the lab, and make a burger. Technology exists. It's still ridiculously expensive, but it provokes the question, do we need animals to make meat in the future? Probably not. And we don't need them for any other things either. We can take a piece of DNA out of a cow, DNA that codes for milk proteins, put it in baker's yeast, throw that in the tank, and have the yeast produce milk. Or gelatin for gummy bears, or egg proteins for eggs, any proteins. So we could actually make completely synthetic cells. We could just engineer a cell that makes all kinds of components to our nu nutrition that we need, have it engineered to take carbon from carbon dioxide from the air or methane from the air. In the air of synthetic biology, all this is possible. And now think, if we could have these tanks, many tanks, growing all these different organisms that would combine, that would make complete human diet, right? Completely contained environment. And then we could take all those components and put them together with 3D printer and have food. Complete transition in food system. I would call that cellular agriculture. And now you say, hold on. That's crazy. That's not my food. <laughs> That's not natural. What about the risks that we cannot see yet? What about playing God? What about, is this technology, will it be equally available for everyone? What are the things that we don't know yet? And you're absolutely right. It is a scary thing. Because we are farmers. But now if you look back to the previous transition in food, agriculture, none of those organisms that we knew, use now to make our food existed. Carrots, cabbages, rice, corn, none of that was there. We created all of them. We created a completely artificial environment where they grow, the fields and the farms. And yes, it did cause a lot of harm for the environment, obviously, but also for us. It narrowed down our diets in the beginning, and settling down caused a lot of infectious diseases that we didn't have before. Agricultural revolution was a transition and it was a trade-off. But without that, we wouldn't be here. So the next transition might be inevitable. If the climate change is enough, we have no other choice than produce our food in completely contained environments. But I hope that there would be, that it would be a choice that we make. It would be a necessary transition that we would willingly make. If we could make our food in small surface area, in contained environments, with extreme efficiency, not wasting resources, we could probably reforest some of those fields. We could live on this planet without consuming it. But it could be much more than that. Now, if we can make that bioreactor farm where we could make the whole complete human diet, that would, for the first time, break the bond that we have to soil and earth. That could actually enable some of us to leave this planet, become a truly interplanetary species, space monkeys. Now, food is in the core of our identity. And when we think of who we are, we tend to look to the past and see that we are farmers. But when you look far enough to the past, it's clear that we have been farmers only a very short part of our history. And it's clear that we cannot go back to be hunter-gatherers. 
Now, we're facing some of the biggest challenges of humanity right now. And we have to use all possible technologies, all possible smart ideas to live on this planet without consuming it. That requires us to fix the current system, stop wasting food, reduce meat consumption, develop better agriculture systems that use resources efficiently. But that also means that we have to take the next transition. We have to develop food production systems that are completely decoupled from the environment. And for that, we need to create completely new synthetic single cell production organisms. Now that thought feels strange and awkward because who we think we are. But the world around us is changing fast. And instead of looking back, we really need to bravely look forward and ask the questions, who will we become next? Thank you.